Hello, everyone. This is uh, your biweekly nonviolence report for late November, and uh, we'll be bringing you highlights of the news, and that is the nonviolence news, and especially picking out items that may not be well analyzed if you were to get them from the mainstream sources. So I think I'd like to, as usual, start with unarmed civilian peacekeeping. Once again, we are in the news, though not mainstream news exactly. There was an article in the journal Sojourners, a Christian magazine. It's by Jessica Skelly, and it's called Stop Rumors, Stop Violence, How Unarmed Protectors Keep Us Safe. And it's an in-depth report on how well we did in protecting the recent election. I might just mention that stopping rumors is one of the most effective things that nonviolent interveners do. And that was noted and planned for even when Gandhi set up his Shanti Sena or Peace Army in India. So Jessica Skelly talks about mediators beyond borders. She talks about choose democracy. She talks about DC peace teams. We're going to mention a little bit more about that. And she talks about hold the line and all these other groups which really work wonderfully together to provide a secure environment in which people could vote. So very, very mainstream for our democracy. And I want to just read you one quote from her article. All of these initiatives are part of a sophisticated movement to use disciplined nonviolence to protect our democracy. So that's a very good uh, highlight for us to start off with. Uh, I'm going to move now to an indigenous uh, action. This is among the Lakota, and we're reading a lot about indigenous movements and their protests, but they don't just protest. They, they are bringing in constructive programs. So. Uh, in Rapid City, South Dakota, they've created a small community for homeless indigenous people, and it's a traditional community. So people not only get a place to live, they reconnect with their culture, they get grounding in traditional values, and they engage in meaningful work, which is extremely important, as we know, for upgrading our sense of self-worth. So, you know, they're being able to stay sober and, and help others. And of course, they're not getting any pay for doing this. So this is, to me, an example of how nonviolent efforts are actually planting seeds for the future. So for environment issues, there is just a lot going on. And I just want to mention three. Uh, and these are the pluses. These are the successes. There's also setbacks. But here's just three of many uh, successes recently in, the, in Key West, which is a popular Caribbean tourist cruise site city. They have recently banned large ships and they're doing this to protect the coral reefs. Coral reefs are in extreme danger all over the world through pollution and of course through deep draft vessels like cruise ships. So of course, you know, this will also help with the pandemic while we're at it. Another example of choose to do one nonviolent thing and, and other benefits accrue. You can read more about this on ecowatch.com. Now, uh, mayors in the US have unveiled a $60 billion plan to help the Midwest energy transition transitioning to green energy sources. $60 billion, that is a considerable amount of money. Uh, it will help throughout the Midwest region where there is a lot of wind and solar. And, and finally, the European Union is planning again a mammoth expansion of their offshore wind farms. Now, offshore wind has been a big source of renewable energy in Germany. I think they get 40% of their energy is in renewables, last I heard, and a lot of that is wind. Of course, you'd expect less solar. So that's just a taste, if you will, of the environment news. Now for other issues, in the city of Corcoran, California, which is 
not in between Bakersfield and Fresno. That city, Corcoran, has one of the largest prison facilities in the state. In fact, two such facilities. And there is now a hunger strike and a work stoppage going on because inadequate protections from the pandemic. And of course, this is a drastic problem, I think, second only to uh, care facilities. It's in prisons where we're seeing almost like, uh, you know, what shall I say, a kind of massacre of the pandemic. So this particular facility in Corcoran is operating at 130% capacity. And one of the hunger strikers, who's now in his 14th day, has this quote to offer, I have lost all hope in humanity because of how California and the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation has failed to protect individuals like myself. And he's David Cawthon, he's 32 years old. And as I say, he's on his 14th day of his hunger strike. So again, I want to highlight that um, profound human issue that it touches upon. Of course, uh, you know, the, what were they to do? Uh, the prison authorities, they didn't have space to ship people out. You can't just put people out on the street who have been incarcerated, though in some cases, you know, a lot of that was done. Um, but I, I think that's a profound comment for us to think about. I've lost all hope in humanity because it's possibly an exaggeration, of course, but it does touch on the way that nonviolence drills down to very basic issues. You can get more about this uh, on the website of the Oakland Abolition and Solidarity Organization, uh, or watch them on Twitter at Oakland A-B-O-S-O-L. So moving abroad, popular protests continue in Belarus, in Thailand, where it's mainly women and students who are carrying it on, and in Okinawa. So to take Okinawa first, every day, except for typhoon days and so forth, but even during the pandemic, charter buses go to particular sites on the island of Okinawa, where the Japanese government is trying to build a super air base for the U.S. Marines. And what these people do is various kinds of obstruction. They, and in one a particular example of that, they're using kayaks to cluster around the bow of a ship and prevent it for a while from moving out. So it's slowing down. It's like a, like a work stoppage caused by other people. So this reminds us of the kayaktivism that took place up in Washington state and successfully delayed the launch of uh, an oil exploration rig until it was too late for them to sail. And so they, they put, put off exploration out at sea there for a year. Uh, but you know, uh, this reminds me very much of the Jeju Island protests in South Korea, where once again, the issue was uh, Asian government trying to do something that's harmful to the environment and to people. In the case of Jeju, it actually was a sacred uh, mountain that was being destroyed uh, for the sake of the U.S. military. And these protests, again, were kind of scripted. You go out there, you sit down, you block things up for a while, you get arrested, you get hauled away, and uh, and, and it just continues. So you slow things down, you don't stop them. And this caused me to wonder whether we shouldn't be taking this issue up in our country because we, it's our military that's doing this and we can go through Congress, through representatives and get them to stop some of these destructive actions. So, so much for Okinawa. You know, it's an interesting thing to watch. Now in Thailand, the protests are continuing, and one of the examples of how they're doing it now is something, a song called Rap Against Dictatorship, and it has become a powerful way to spread the word on these protests. 
uh, they made a music video hit with over 5 million views. Sorry, we don't have the clip to share with you. But the music covers topics such as uh, Buddhist tradition, protests, bullying. And they also mention the October 1976 Thammasat University massacre. So a bit of a background there. Uh, this was a really violent crackdown by police and it brought in paramilitaries who were even more violent. There were lynchings, there were, there were killings. I won't go into the details. The official reports state that 46 students were killed and 167 wounded unofficial reports much higher than that, as you might expect. In the events of October, uh, the military dictatorship, which had ruled Thailand for more than a decade, was overthrown. However, it provided the excuse, the excuse for a coup. And so you had this brief Thai spring, I like to call it, which in, where for a couple of years, there were efforts at democratic reform and mod modifying the monarchy. But what's different now is that the present protesters are very aware of that danger and they are organizing themselves not to produce the kind of chaos that provides an excuse for a coup. So uh, I hope at some point to be reporting on a successful conclusion of these protests. Up to now, they're staying very nonviolent, both of them, Okinawa and Thailand, at least uh, what we call non-dash violent, that is people are not using violence. Uh, they may not be getting into both the deeper grounding, the deeper commitment personally, though I suspect a lot of those people are, and I'm not getting into the wider array of techniques, though in Thailand that does seem to be improving some. So that is about all of the news events I had to share with you on this episode, and I'd like to talk about some resources. Uh, on December 8th, there will be a webinar called How to Fight and Win with Humor. And I want to make a comment. Uh, humor is definitely a nonviolent method, and it's a great diffuser of tensions. Think of one famous episode where our friend Karen Ridd from PBI, Peace Brigades International thing. Karen Ridd from Peace Brigades International was stopped at a checkpoint in Central America and the guards would not let her through. Turns out that Karen was a professional clown. Went back to the car, opened the trunk, put on her clown uniform and came out and clowned for a while. And so the guys just, you know, completely let her through. So I'm all in favor of humor. Humor is a nonviolent method, but fight and win is not a nonviolent attitude. So, you know, check out that webinar, but you think, I think you may find it's a bit of a mixed bag. Now, a few days later on December 12th, there will be a soul force retreat with our friends Rivera Sun and Veronica Policarich. And this is organized both by Campaign Nonviolence and Pache Bene. And you can register at pacheabene.org. They're calling this the dance of contemplation and right action. Well, I love the combination of contemplation and right action. And I'm just betting that the dancing part was Rivera's idea. Anyway, uh, there's a summit planning committee that's coming up a month later, January 10th, here in Sonoma County, and it's called It's Up to Us. They've created a social media and invitation toolkit to help activists reach their personal networks using both their personal networks and social media hosts and professional online accounts. So if you want to look this up online, look at SoCo Can, Sonoma County, capital C-A-N, and you should be able to find that January summit. Elsewhere in the U.S., uh, our friend Eli McCarthy of DC Peace Teams 
I said we'd get back to as offering many, many resources and trainings. They have to do with restorative justice, victim offender dialogues, bystander intervention, unarmed civilian protection and accompaniment, and a lot of nonviolent communication training. If you go to DC Peace Teams, uh, it's also there's a Facebook event, you should be finding some of those upcoming trainings. Also, they say, let us know if you have a group or an organization that would like training. And this is, you know, we saw how effective this was in mobilizing teams fairly quickly to protect uh, the election. And it's a kind of training which I think all of us can benefit from and do a lot of good with. So then let me close uh, today's episode by just mentioning a couple of things about the Meta Center. Uh, in a couple of days, our month as film of the month on Tricycle Magazine's film club will be ending. But on December 10th, which is Human Rights Day, the Stanford Arts Program will be rescreening our film, The Third Harmony. That'll be Thursday, December 10th from 4 to 5 p.m. And these are the same organizers who put on the highly successful United Nations Association Film Festival, had our film in it, and uh, they'll be rescreening it again with some kind of panel. They're hoping to get Rajmohan Gandhi uh, to be on it, and uh, we will keep you posted about that. And I might just mention that uh, the Meta Center is moving to a newer and better office suite on the first of the year. So here's hoping that the pandemic will end. You will be able to come and visit us at 205 Keller Street in Petaluma. So that was today's episode, everybody. Thank you very much for listening and watching. And I'll be with you again in a, in a week.